Well, good morning. It's Dr. Matthew Dunn, host of The Future of Email. My guest today, my my Zoom and conference buddy, Luke Glasner, principal of Glasner Consulting. Hey, Luke. Hello. Thanks for nice. having me on today. Oh man, delightful. Uh, good, get, good to get uh, good to get some one to one conversation time instead of you know literally zooming past each other in other forms. Right. Uh, yes. I give people the umbrella of like of Glasner Consulting and your incredibly long, deep involvement in the world of email. Yes. So I've been involved in email since two thousand five, where I started out as a database administrator that launched an email program at a company called Robin Publishing, and we made 12 trade magazines. And I would make our newsletter every week, as well as our other emails. And then after doing that about five years, I um, decided to start doing consulting, basically because a bunch of other people in the industry had encouraged me to go out on my own. So I did, and I started Glasser Consulting in 2009. And, uh, my first project was in August of that year. And I officially launched a couple, like two months later, once I got paid <laughs> and, you know, so for the last 15, 17 years or so, I've been neck deep in email. It is truly my passion and I've done pretty much everything you could do in email. I've done deliverability. I've done a lot of coding. I'm big into doing production of email. Um, I like doing that. So that's a bit different than what most people probably think of when they see the speakers. I do sit in the cube and send the emails all the time, although I have a nicer cube now. <laughs> you're, you're, being un, you're, you're being unduly modest because among, among the high points of your LinkedIn bio, you've sent over 10,000 campaigns. Yes, I have, I have coded and sent over 10,000 campaigns. I typically wow. average. Even as a consultant, I was averaging three, four campaigns a week. Wow. And, you know, I've done all kinds of things with that code. I've, I've, I started out with getting into responsive design for mobile. I've done yeah. what a lot of people call kinetic or interactive emails. Mm -hmm. So like in the past year, I did a, a, a campaign with a picture of a champagne bottle opening for New Year's Eve and made little bubbles float. And then I did the reverse of the technique you normally see online for snow where it comes down. And I made the little dots go up. So I had bubbles for Christmas. We had a snowstorm in the email. I've done nice. a bunch of rollover effects and other CSS effects that you can do. I was going to ask um, if the bubbles were CSS. That's, uh, that's pretty tricky. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I've done that. And I've even done make the email and see with the CSS effect which won't play well across clients. Like for example, Google Gmail won't play that. So yeah. after I made it, I actually took a screenshot of that to make an animated GIF that I used in the other versions yeah. of the email. Yeah. In the other versions of the email. One of the things that I think John Q public doesn't uh, appreciate or care about and justifiably so is how darn complex the end points for email are the, the technical and design considerations for how do we make this look right for believe the numbers, 15,000 different combinations of email clients and operating systems. And it, 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 it's like, it's an air ball. Yeah. It's, it's, it's everywhere there and there's no real standard. No. And, um, that makes it a lot harder than coding for like web design. Where you, oh yeah. Yeah. You typically yeah. have like a standard for the browser and there's like four or five of them. We have, you know. 17 flavors of Apple iPhone and yeah. 50 different screen sizes you got to worry about yeah, <laughs> and all kinds of things going on. And now one thing I've noticed with the, with the client, my retail client that I make emails for every week, we've been tracking with Litmus and I've noticed that his group has gone up to 55, 60% use dark mode. So there's another wrinkle. Now you have to have a dark mode version. Yeah. Uh, and he's also heavily Gmail because it's B to C. So then you need an annotations or AMP version. Right. 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 Take advantage of that. Yeah. So yeah, it's a complex coding world out there. And it's definitely something that is requires some real skill. And I personally, I write my emails. I usually use Litmus. Um, before that, I use Dreamweaver, but I write mine from code. I don't use editor. I've never liked that. 
What's your, uh, what's your code editor of choice? Um, well, Litmus is what I have used primarily because it's basically just like notepad, but it shows me a, a picture. Right. I've also used, uh, what is it? Coffee cup HTML is a pretty decent editor. I like Dreamweaver and used that for a very long time. I never upgraded my Dreamweaver. I kept it in old version so that it stayed with that email 1999 mentality of coding. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. but for me, you know, when you've written them this long and this many times, you, you, I, I could write the email in Notepad. It doesn't really matter anymore. Right. Memorize them all. Right. And you probably have a whole bunch of keyboard shortcuts to do. Yes, I have all my library and all my yeah. past emails. I honestly never, I really never make an email from scratch anymore. I just find, oh, I used that layout two months ago and yeah. let me pick up that and then edit the structure from there. Um, but I'm also always improving it, looking at things, you know, does it, does it look right in dark mode? For example, one of the things I've done there is we, all our product images usually had like it's the product on a white background, right? And that's pretty standard. But on dark mode, that looks Boom. like a white box. Yeah. So I started editing those and just using Magic Eraser and Photoshop to just take the white background off and then use a transparent. So that almost the cold, like whole new versions of the thing, I can get away with that. It will look right in either one. Right. Um, so that's one quick tag trick that I could share about getting into dark mode. Wow. It, you just gave me a good idea. We should, we should, uh, license one of the AI background removers and uh, wrap a tool around that for, uh, for images in, in campaign genius, just because that job, you know, it's a very manual job yes. and you do it once and it's interesting and you do it 20 times and you want to just hit yourself in the head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been just, you know, I'm, I do the products as we go along and I've been yeah. doing it for about two months now. So we've cycled through most of the products. Yeah. Before. There you go. At least yeah, most of me feature an email. There's plenty that we don't normally feature. So you, uh, you to need them. You've also, you also help clients a ton. And I know that you're like, you're an industry expert, I'd say on, uh, on yeah. email and metrics. Yes. Kind of a passion. I have a long history with email metrics and that's really where my passion in email started. I mentioned I used to work, uh, you know, at a publishing company. Yeah. Back then that was when we started the same project. And it was because we changed vendors and my open and click rates radically changed because of a different counting methodology. Right. So I felt that burn personally. That's why I volunteered. And, um, you know, I ended up working and contributing a lot with the, with what was first the round table and then the advisory board. And then it has another name now, um, at the EEC for the same project I actually ended up beating a lot of the same project because I was the client side person. So I didn't have any, I, I didn't represent any vendor. Um, and I represented what, what the email marketers wanted. So that's really what I got into and opens was like a big thing with me. And, uh, you know, um, we came up with the standard for opens metrics measurement as well as clicks. And we also delved into delivered which isn't really delivered. It's more like accepted. That was our term that we put forward. And that all culminated in the same project standard, which was released in 2010. Mm -hmm. And at that time we had about 30, 35, uh, different ESPs involved in the committee over time. Yeah. All the big ones that you would remember from back in the day, like silver pop Warren was very involved in that project. Um, exact target was on there, a, a ton of you know, all the people that you would have thought as the big names and who you would see at the conferences, they all contributed and had their say. And then when we launched, we had adoption from some of them, but also a bunch of other people. We used to have a seal that we gave for them to display on their website. And, you know, I said it, it I tried to make it a truly global effort, mm -hmm. um, and get the input from ESPs, not just in North America, cause we were the EEC and the, and then by then we were part of DMA, you know, but not just there, but around the world. And we did have ESPs adopt our standard from, uh, 
from different countries, not only the U.S., but also Canada, U.K., Italy, um, Belarus, New yeah. Zealand. You know, so when I say it's a global standard, I would say New Zealand is about as far away as you can get from Midtown Manhattan on the globe. So we definitely went around the world and over 1,000 marketers got involved and commented or, you know, signed to do things over, over the course of the life of the project. So, so I, I think we did good work and, you know, while I don't really see the same seal on people's sites anymore, I do notice that most ESPs I've worked with have adopted and used that standard for their own me measurement. You know, that's a, that's a, a, a great reef story on a, a fairly important and I think underappreciated aspect of uh the internet set of technologies like the, the hard work the collaborative hard work in involved in standards and standardization and adoption of standards i mean arguably it's really transformed the world we're all working on talking on you know standards um, right and we kind of take it for granted or think of it as wallpaper in and at the same time uh, it's not, it's not, it's hard to get there for one thing. Yes. It definitely took a lot of work by everyone involved. Myself, yeah. John, uh, Caldwell was my co-chair in that project. So shout oh, yeah. out to him. Yeah. Warren McDonald led the project for a while. And so did David Daniels. He's the one who originally started. So I want to make sure that I, you know, mention all of them. Nice. But I used to say when I was arguing for that, for this adoption, that the standard showed Having a standard show that as an industry, email had reached maturity, that we weren't just some fad thing or whatever. And email had been around, you know, a good 20, 30 oh, wow. years <laughs> by that point, right? Because it started long before that. But what we think of as like the email industry had probably been around 10 years at that point. I would, you know, I don't know that there was really that much of an industry before we had the World Wide Web. I mean, there were certainly ESPs and, and there's people that I know that worked at them at that time and were already doing email at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, that was a big part of showing that we had staying power as an industry and that we were here to stay and that yeah. we had reached maturity and that we were something marketers and, and higher up the executive level, the CEOs, the CMOs needed to pay attention to. And that we had a real standard for measurement, that it wasn't just the wild west anymore. This was something you could worry about and, yeah. um, and, and have a real answer to. Yeah. And that's, that's worth unpacking in, I think in contrast with other digital channels, I, I I've said before, and I'll stand by one of the things I like about email is that nobody owns it. And when you get something like, uh, standardized and widely adopted, uh, metrics for key things marketers care about that means that that marketer can change platforms without blowing up all of their measurements I look at other digital channels particularly a lot of social media channels and that is not true it's like right you're captive and and you're captive of the way the dominant vendor defines things um and the audiences that they've got captive and the toll that they want to Put on the gate and that's one of the things that's cool about email is you don't actually you don't have that uh lock-in um and yeah. i agree with your point about maturity as well yeah and and you know one of the things i used to say is is you know at the time there was a lot of brouhaha in the industry about benchmark reporting because everyone was making one um and but the problem was was that if there's no standard Every benchmark report defines what it is differently. Differently. And so there's no real way to compare yourself to a variety of them where you could get some kind of consensus. You're always just looking at whatever the one available in your own vendor is. And the other thing I used to say is about the standards was imagine if your GPS signal or your GPS in your core had no standard. Sometimes a mile was 5,200 feet. Sometimes it was kilometers. Sometimes it was something else. You might get to the street that you're going to, but you'll never get to the location you're going to because you're always going to be off a little bit. It's like yeah. using a compass and map and not bothering to account for magnetic north. Yeah. 
when I did that, at, you know, at a scout meeting a couple of weeks ago, I showed them only going five miles on the map, we were half a mile off from what we were trying to get to. So that's a very real thing that happens. If people don't have this, then you end up going the wrong places with your program. And I feel like part of the reason why I've started talking about this again is, is because I'm beginning to see a return to what I saw 10 years ago now, yes. which is open rates are shot from Apple MPP. We did webinar on that with, with OI. And, um, the other thing I've seen a big rise in the last few months and some talk I've uh, about it around the industry is inaccuracy in click reporting. And this is something that I've been starting to really get into and, and look at is that I go into my reports and I look at who clicked uh, on the various links, you know, and you see a lot of people talking about, well, they're all clicking on the logo at the top or the, whatever the first link is. And when I look at that, and then I look at the timestamp from when I sent the email and when they clicked, I see people that click, I've literally clicked every email I've sent for 90 days, yeah. all within one minute of delivery. Yeah. Little suspect. Clicked every link in the email. Yeah. 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 That's not a real person. That's not a real person. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. now we are back at the same place where we have big inaccuracies in open rates. We have big inaccuracies in click rates. In, in yeah. one client, I saw the, the vendor had, uh, their ESP had a tool to like programmatically just filter it out if it happens within like 30 seconds or whatever, however they determine it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, our clicks halved yep. when we turned that on. Yeah. It shows like how much really like, and I knew there was a problem and, and I, and I knew it was a, a decent sized problem, but I didn't think it was really half of everything reported. That's a huge amount. Yeah to be yeah. misjudging your inactives and your engaged by, or the, the quality of your, of, of your creative and coke, right? Like that's a big problem. And I'm honestly surprised when Apple MPP was announced, people ran around like chicken little and said the sky was falling. This problem has been around at least three years and I've yeah. never really seen anybody make a big brouhaha about it. And I don't think most marketers realize this is happening. Well. I mean, in grappling and we campaign genius, we had to grapple with MPP from a, from a different perspective, but we took a fairly deep dive and in looking and trying to make sense of uh, the signals and the data there, we ended up bumping into exactly the thing you're talking about, uh, the, the clear robo repeat automated, this is not a human being stuff. And as I've talked with, um, as I've talked with vendors and marketers in the email space, I'm a little frustrated because it does seem like marketers are the, the prisoner of the tool that they happen to be using. Not all tools have addressed either the MPP set of issues or the robo open or robo click set of issues. And if, if you're a marketer, you're like, I don't want to have to go that deep. I don't know how to do that, which is fair. So. How do we start making some headway with being more accurate about what's actually happening? Is it metrics 2.0? <laughs> yeah, I think we need to do basically what we did last time, which is for the marketers to put pressure on their vendors yeah. to account for this, or at least to make it known, does your system account for this? Yeah. I I use a lot of different ESPs as a consultant, so I use whoever the client has. So, you know, some I see do basically nothing on this and just report it all. Others I see have tools built in yep. and, um, some, it doesn't seem like I see nearly as much. So they're obviously doing something, but there's no, there's no visibility about that from yep. them, right? There's yep. no communication about that. Or it was communicated a few years ago when they, when it first happened. Yeah. Right. But most, but today you don't really know that it's just up to you to go look at your reports and see, yeah. Yeah. does this happen all the time and how big of a problem is it? Yeah. Yeah. And if there's no, uh, if, if there's no drill down to go, okay, wait a minute, how did you come up with this number? What did you throw out? Why did you throw it out? Can I adjust the, the throw out parameters, for example, 
then you're still kind of a prisoner of the glass dashboard in front of you. And yes. it, you know, there's only so much time in the day, only so much expertise to go around. I can understand why marketers can be a bit defensive about what their tools say, but it's a tough problem to fight. It's like, I know your tool says that, but that can't right. be right. It can't be right. Something smells funny here. Kind of, kind of what you said. And it's a tough one to come, tough, a tough one to combat. It's like as an industry, our standards haven't kept up with change. No, um, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of change in the past one to two years, and yes. it's probably part of why I see people talking about that again is is mm. because we need to update it, yeah. and we need to push to have accurate metrics to make decisions, right? That, you know, and this isn't a new problem for the internet, right? We, we can look to other channels like search has had a huge problem with click fraud for years and years from the beginning. Right. right. And by now they have some pretty good solutions to address that, or at least they've been trying to make good solutions for the last 10, 20 years. Uh -huh. Um, so, you know, we can look to that and start to say, okay, can, can, what, what? did they do to combat this issue? Can we also do the same thing? Yeah. You know, my simple thing is if the person clicks every email, you know, I get toward emails and I click in them because I get a point if I do right for their, for their thing, uh, for their loyalty program. Right. So I'm actively trying to click that just to get that point. Cause I, I like to play these little email games and I get on a good month, maybe 20. So to see somebody click literally every email, no, nobody does that. Nobody Even does. people attempting to do that don't manage to do that. Yeah. So if you see that, you know that that's really, that person's got a filter or, or something that's, you know, usually it's like some kind of spam filter that's preach fetching the link to check for yeah. antivirus yeah. in case anybody's watching and wondering why do they do this? Yes. So that's what they're doing. They're checking, they're prefetching links and checking it to make it load fast and all the other reasons why we prefetch things. Right. Um, but it's being recorded. And then because the ESP doesn't know, you know, it, 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 the redirect was hit and it counts the click. And so maybe it's time to look at how do we actually, what are the methodologies we use to measure things? And is it time to think about better methodologies, right? opens was measured traditionally with pixel. We've shown that that doesn't, that's kind of blown out of the water. That's yeah. not a viable long-term thing. So we need something else, you know, and maybe that's, you know, and this is probably a pie in the sky dream, but maybe that's getting the big ISPs to come together because they don't use a tracking pixel to tell whether you, you do it. They mark it as when it's marked red in, yeah. in your inbox, they know you opened it. So they have it. They could share it, but they probably won't. And I, and, and, you know, or at least like, I did not looking for like, tell me specifically who it is like an open pixel does. Cause I know they'll never share that. There's no right. point in fighting that battle at all. But Postmasters tools, for example, will give you spam complaints without actually telling you who it is. So, you know, I have a problem or I don't, right. they would do signals like that to us. That would be helpful for marketers. And for them, because we will stop emailing people that don't want to hear from us. Right, right. One of the inadvertent uh, uh, misfires of Apple's uh, approach with MPP is we now don't have a, a way to distinguish who's interested, who's not. So we, were, may, we may well be uh, sending them more rather than less. I know I'm, I'm sending, at least for recent, more. Because I don't have a signal and, you know, um, I can't take it down and just click because yeah. that's, that's, there's not enough. I'll lose like 90% of the list. And so will everyone else I've spoken to, like yeah. that's not going to work. I mean, the average, average click rates on emails are something like 4%. Like that's, that's just not, this is not enough to work with to make broad list based decisions. You can't yeah. say segment based on click. I'm only segmenting 4% of people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, it, it's, it's, you won't have the volume necessary to make, to make the conversions and the sales you need to keep the program running. You yeah. Know? And you won't have, uh, 
you certainly won't have subscriber level of what's the phrase I despise it first party data if that's your only signal because you're not going to accumulate enough to be really particularly meaningful I, I don't think how how do we take this in a different direction though we we've got this continual um challenge that I think we're recognizing at a broad cultural level of recon reconciling reconciling privacy with uh you know clarity and effectiveness hey I want you to tell me about stuff I'm interested in, but I don't want you to know anything about me. Okay, how are we supposed to pull this stuff up, right? How do we how do we make those two things marry up? No, that's difficult. And I think it's that in some ways you need to give the controls to the subscribers. And that's not necessarily easy to do. Yeah, that's tough. And the other problem with that is is that in my experience, even trying to give the controls to the subscriber over things like frequency. The reality is, is the majority of subscribers don't respond at all. Right. Right. Like they don't go mark a preference for their frequency. Right. right. I yeah. send out, hey, come update your preferences. I get like 15% that actually update their preferences. Yeah. That means 85% eating. Right. So on my list of, you know, usually well north of 100,000, that's thousands and tens of thousands of people who didn't bother to give me their preference. You know, maybe you could ask it when they opt in, but that will decrease your opt in rate. So you're not right. going to do that, right? You're not going <laughs> to add fields to that because that's going to make less. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, and, and I, and I have always been, you know, on the side of, of the subscriber having their own preferences and their own privacy. I, I would want that too. On the same time, as someone that owns a domain name and I've owned a domain name since 1996. Um, you came to my site, you came to my server, you basically, if this was the real world, you came to my house. I have a right to know who's coming in my house, right? So that's kind of, I get the other idea too. It's like, well, you chose to do all this stuff. You gave me the data. I don't, I don't, I think people often don't think about the ramifications of trading off privacy for convenience, and that has happened too much. Um, on the other hand, you want us to target the stuff to you. You don't want me to send you relevant stuff. You don't want me to send you kid clothes when you have no kids, right? So you don't want me to send you winter coats if you live in Florida. You want me to send you things that are relevant. And in order to do that, you got to tell me what's relevant yeah. to you. And you know, so maybe it's just a bigger education of the populace to get them to do a little more. But again, as someone that's fought for a standard before, I could tell you that will probably not happen. Yeah. I mean, we'll make strides and we'll get a good amount, but you're never going to get the the scale that you need. Well, so and practically speaking, right, put on your, both of us put on, you know, consumer beanies for a second and go, yeah, how long of how long a form will I actually fill out? Answer, not very long. How often will I click the link to go update the did it did it because it's because you asked me to? Answer, not, uh, not all the time, not right? Me. Email folks talk about, you need a preference center, not an unsubscribe. I'm like, eh, yeah, I don't care, right? Make it easy for me to do whatever because my attention span as a 21st century consumer is somewhat goldfish-like. And, right. and if I don't see a real reason to invest in it, if, you know, if I'm going to go ahead and say, if Amazon said here, spend four minutes doing this, this, and this, so we can do an even better job of sending a truck to your house just about every day, I might do it because I can sort of run the math of is, is that four minutes going to pay itself back? Yeah. But how many lists are you on? How many lists are I on where I don't actually transact in the course of a year? Why would I invest time in making it? better. I, I'm staying on the list probably because I'm too lazy to click the unsubscribe button. Right. Right. You know, you, you, you have what I like to call the emotionally unsubscribed. Those are those <laughs> 50 percent of people that are basically apathetic to your mail. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I often look at that and it's kind of like when you start to think about this, right? I am so indifferent to your email that I wouldn't bother to unsubscribe. Yes. I wouldn't bother to mark you as spam. I wouldn't bother to do anything. I have a rule. You go in the folder and I never look at your stuff. Right, right. You don't exist. And, and 
you don't know that I don't look. Thanks, Apple. Right. Right. <laughs> and, but if you stop sending to me that day that I actually wanted to buy that thing from you, if you weren't there, guess yeah. what? I'm going to the next guy on the list. Yeah. That is there. Yeah. So it's quite the balancing act, but the idea that people are going to, when do people update preferences or, or do anything like that? When they do something major where they change their address, like, Hey, I had my identity stolen, so I'm changing my email address everywhere. That's when they'll look at it or some other major thing. I changed jobs and this is no longer my work email. So I'll right. let people know I'm over here now. Right. right. Um, but other than that, very rarely do you see people that aren't email marketers themselves actually do these things. Um, unless there's some kind of benefit to the subscriber, if it yeah. was, Hey, update your preferences and I'll give you five bucks, then maybe I would, yeah. if yeah. it was five bucks over my order, that's a lesser, maybe if it was $5 cash that you'll send to me, that that's that you just went up the thing. And would that be worth it? Mm -hmm. Probably. Probably. Honestly, could you require a subscriber for less than the five bucks? Because if you can get them to come click and show some activity yeah. and get back into actually reading your mail, yeah. right, then, you know, that was well worth it. And I find that, you know, and, and the engagement stuff that I often see, people wait a few months after they stop engaging. If the person already stopped engaging with you, they're not going to read the re-engagement email either. You need to figure out where that drop-off is beforehand so that it becomes a habit. And I know that where that time is, habits typically take 90 to 120 days to form. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, my wife is a psychologist and she says if somebody does something for three months, they'll probably keep doing it, right? So at the end of three months, if the person is opening your emails fairly consistently, say one out of four, one out of five, it's not going to be like every, but like not never, they're probably going to continue to do that. If they've already started to drop off a lot, trying to hit them with that re-engagement before they, before they're emotionally unsubscribed and just don't care about you at all. I like that. And how many of those will just, when they go in and see all those emails for you, even though they didn't unsubscribe, they'll still mark and they did sign up and they did interact with you. They'll still mark you as fan because that's the easiest thing to do. Yeah. They're going to do the easiest thing to do every, every time. Every time, yeah. again, time. There's another, I think there's another driver of this disconnect that's, uh, it's inside baseball to talk about, but it, okay, we're having an inside baseball conversation. Email team, web team, not usually the same team. No. So when you, when you think the logical thing to do would be, hey, he's in the middle of checkout, ask him just one extra question about email preferences. I've almost never seen that. Why? Email team, web team, separate teams, separate yeah. priorities, plans, et cetera, et cetera. It's like they're completely dependent on each other for, in the business context, but it's not the same folks. And so if the email guys say, hey, we want our preference thing, and the other web team is going to like, we're busy. We're, we're, right. It doesn't work that well, way. It's not, back. And they're separate systems as well. The number of email platforms that do web pages is pretty damn small. Yes non-existent yeah i mean there's there's a few but there's not many and the ones that do do it usually lock you into their like editor it's not like yeah not a real website yeah yeah i i have seen some signals of of like a better interop story particularly out of shopify plus plus clavio seems like those guys are playing together at a higher and higher level all the time and that's promising in a sense especially because the customer base for Shopify plus Klaviyo is a small, medium-sized business, does not have time or a team to do this stuff by hand. So there's, yes. there's a vendor sort of raising the game. Cool. But then we get back to, are they measuring things the same way everybody else is? You know, is, there, is it standardized or is it just a proprietary advantage? And uh, I don't know the answer to that. Yes. One of the few that I've seen that have done a very good job on that was Dot Digital and their Magento, which yeah. is now Adobe Commerce integration. That's super tight. Yeah. And 
it really reads like right off the stuff. When I, when I look at the number in there, in the one system, when I look at the number in the other system for like orders and revenue and stuff, they actually they, match. Wow. They match because they get that number from the commerce system. And that has been a huge thing that I've also fought metrics related is how much money did email make? Gmail says one thing, the ESP says another, and, and the commerce system sends a third. And which of those is the real number? And your website analytics is a fourth. Right. And I know that out of those, if I have to pick a number to live and die by, it's the one in the commerce system. Sure. They took the charge. That's who collected the money. However much money they collected is the money. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so forget about all the other ones. Cause that's the only one that really matters when it really comes down to making the decision yeah. and you need to be able to get to that. And you're not going to really be able to get to it usually through your ESP. It's very yeah. rare that you see something like dot digitals. There's yeah. the only one that I've seen that did that. Um, but that's what marketers need to know because you need to know not fuzzy math money. You need to know how much money you made. And another thing I'll throw out there for marketers, revenue or demand generated is not how much money you made. If you think that I ran this campaign for email and it cost a thousand dollars and it made a thousand dollars, it did not break even, right? The products you're selling cost money. The producing of the work costs money. Shipping in them costs money. People, I often see this in marketers, do not take account for things like COGS, cost of goods sold. So when they're saying they got this return, no, you didn't because the return isn't on how much money you generated. Right. It's on how much money you actually made, the profitability. Yeah. Revenue, this income, and not, income not regular to revenue. Yeah. You, you, you reduced the amount of money that came in by 20% to make the sales. So now you're only making 10% of that number. So if it was $100 and you were making... 30 bucks, and then you took off 25. Now you're only really making five. Yeah. You're going to make a lot more of them yeah. to do that. And I don't see many people, they, they look at it and said, we generated $2,000 and they stopped there, but go right. beyond that. Yeah. The CEO yeah, wants advice. profits. The business wants profits. They don't want demand generation. That's why we use these terms. It's dollars. Nobody cares about any other fancy term. It's money. Stop talking about things in ways that they're not. Yeah. Our, our mutual friend, Gene Jennings will always drive back to what, like, what's the business outcome you're measuring? Not all of the other yeah, digital things that can be captured and which are usually suspect anyway, but what's the actual you know, ringing of the cash register, um, bottom line profit kind of stuff. And, and it's on a business to have that discipline top to bottom and communicate those numbers top to bottom. You can't stick the email marketer in the closet and say, you're supposed to know this. You got to make sure they have access to the data to know it, to be fair. Yes. Yes. It's not, it's not, it's often not fair to the email marketer because they don't have access to the real number. They're, right. they're going by whatever we did, you know, and, or the company just picks like, we're just going to all use Google analytics number, right. no matter what, right. you know. So that we can have some standardized thing. But the fact is, is they should probably share the real numbers. And, and I, I understand where marketers come from because in my experience, those numbers, are, the last five years, those numbers are shared pretty commonly prior to that. They were not, and they were never in the ESP. You know, it's couldn't work. They were, they were like fairy tale numbers. They weren't <laughs> real numbers, you know, so marketers need to demand that. But the people above them need to be interested in sharing that. And, and in my experience, they're not. Yeah. yeah well, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's almost an HR and or org structure problem to begin with. I have a fair number of conversations with email marketers and they tend to spend most of their time inside the, the ESP and a couple of other tools. Like, yes. That broader view, it's like, it's not on their screen and it's hard enough to do the job they're doing now. Um, so they get kind of like, nope, this is what, this is what I get. This is the measures I get. This is what defines success. Not really, but okay. Yeah. Well, that's what they're, that's what they're graded on to a degree. Yeah. Right? Those, are graded on. <laughs> those are the numbers we come in and we report on them. 
and you're judging my job based on that. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is, is you're not aligning the email team's wording and goals to be judged on with the business ones. Yeah. And this lack of alignment causes a lot of problems. And it's not just email, it's virtually every function within the business. Sure. Many businesses, if you could perfectly align all the teams and processes in your business, I, w I would say you have achieved a competitive advantage that will be hard to match. Are because you to do that yeah. is such an endeavor. And yeah. by the time you get it done, it will have changed, right? There'll be another tool, another measurement system, another thing that had to be added in. Yeah. Yeah. I remember for a while, people did try to do that and most didn't get there. Because by the time they managed to actually complete all that alignment, either they were 86 in one of the vendors or they had brought in a new channel and, oh, now we're going to bring in social and now we're going to bring in mobile or now we're going to bring in chatbots or whatever we're bringing yeah. in. But by the time you finish that alignment project, one of these has arisen and now it's no longer aligned. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough sort of system thinking problem. And it's not like you can, it's not like you can buy a, a a, a genuine business blueprint that says, you said to make all this stuff work before you even start. You yes, can't buy a blueprint to run an email department either. No. You do a lot of audits. Like when you start with new uh, consulting clients, you'll, you'll do uh, essentially an audit to figure out where they are. Won't you? Yes. That's actually my most popular project is full friends program audits and smaller deliverability audits. And what do you expect to find? based on all, based on, you know, 10,000 plus campaigns worth of experience, what, what problems do you kind of expect to find most of the time? Um, the things that I will often find are outdated automated programs that if you simply updated them or did some testing with them would, would really sing a much nicer song for you. Mm -hmm. Um, not great list management. <laughs> Uh, that's another one. It's like, you know, we're, we're, it's not necessarily that we're hitting lots of inactives or we're not segmented or whatever. We are doing those things, mm -hmm. but usually they're taking so much time that there's a bucket of people in that list that you're not really reaching. You're not really communicating with, mm -hmm. and you can find ways to revive them. And I saw a lot more about that on the pandemic, um, because we were trying to reactivate a lot more of the list because there was no physical store and things like that to go to. Right. So that's another one. Um, what I really look for is two things and, and of course, reporting is the reporting accurate. Are we really reaching the inbox? Do you have art? Are you using the tool? A lot of people spend a lot of money on advanced email system tools. And really all they do is make a couple segments and hit send every month or every week or every time. Right. Are you using the tool? Do you have the resources that you need to use it? How many of those things that you wanted to integrate with that IT team that just never got done? Yeah. Um, you know, we got like 95% there. Basically what I find is, is that a lot of people, when they move, the ESP does a bunch for them. They get, they're going to do the rest. They get about three quarters of the way through that. And a bunch of stuff just never really yeah. completes. Yeah. Because once we start sending emails, we're back to business as usual. That's it. We're out of time to do anything else. Yeah. Another big thing is, is that I find is, is that I often come in and one of the first things I do is sit down with the email team and I said, so tell me all those ideas that you've been pitching to management that they've ignored for the past year. And then I'll pick a few of them because I don't really need to, you, they know what's wrong with the thing. That's, an, that's one thing I would say, trust your own team. And if you don't, then the problem isn't, the problem is, is who you're selected to be on the team, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like you put them in the job, you have to trust them to do them, give them the authority and the power necessary to do that job. Because mm -hmm. often some of the best ideas that I put in my recommendations came directly from the team. And the only difference between why it got implemented now versus when they asked is I asked. Right. Right. right? And. And that's another thing is they don't often ask. They have great ideas. Don't be afraid to share them. Don't, 
Don't don't wait for someone like me to come in and get your <laughs> idea. For need you. a consultant to tell us what we already know. Well, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> sometimes that is a lot of what I'm doing in the program is simply validating the things that they knew with an outside perspective. Another thing I look at a lot, and I, I've done some big projects on this with big retailers, um, is the process and how the team actually works. Do you have some like ridiculous 50 million changes on the day, an hour before the thing goes out process? Yeah. Does it take weeks to get one email approved and out the door? Like I worked with one big retailer. It took them like four to five weeks to make one mail. No, As a coder, I make 20 a week. If I pushed it, I could make 30. That'd yeah. be long days, but I could, I could do that many. And, you know, um, so to take weeks to get this done, like I get their stages and it's a big company and like, I do understand all that, but look at your process of where can you streamline that? Yep. And, and does your QA process really hold up? A lot of places where people fall out is QA process, right? Mm -hmm. They're so rushed that no one's really taking the QA or no one's really dedicated to QA. Mm. Right. We supplement with things like a litmus or a checklist or a whatever, yeah. but when you're cranking out four or five emails every day, <laughs> you're, yeah. you're, you need a different person to QA that. And it can't be someone that already looked at the email like 50 times too. Yeah. It's, uh, from that perspective, it just occurred to me as you were describing it. So it's, it's very much a software development process, even though it doesn't get labeled as such. Yeah. Because you are sending a digital artifact out the door. It's released, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to leave your control the minute the send button is pushed by, by the thousands or millions and right. get in front of your customers. Right. And the only time that the, that the boss is going to actually open your email and read it is going to be the one day that you won't. You sent 101 campaigns in a row that were perfect, but the one he'll open would be 102 where you have the typo on line one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's always what happens. Um, but it is very much like a software process. And once you start adding in different responsive stuff, different dynamic content, now you might Dark bring mode. in AI, dark mode, all these things like, yeah, you're, you're basically making a software product, every campaign. And testing and checking it becomes very difficult, right? It's one thing to make two or three versions and I can check those. It's another one when I get to like one-to-one -one person. How do you check the display of 1.5 million emails? Yeah. It's that are all different. different. Yeah. You're, you can't. You can't. Right. It's once I find once we get beyond five versions, it becomes very difficult to actually QA it. Makes sense. Our, our email marketing team slash departments, are they frequently under-resourced? Yes. They're under-resourced usually on multiple fronts. One is budget. They don't have the money to get the tools, but the biggest one is headcount and time. People. People. Right think that putting together an email campaign is going to take a half hour or an hour. I actually had someone complain to me that turning a email from scratch around in under an hour was taking too long. Wow. I'm like, <laughs> you don't know how this works, do you? <laughs> could you, Cody, I'll give you the whole day. Let's see if you could do it. You know, right. like, so yes, the amount of campaigns and this is, and I work with a lot of big retailers. When people yeah. ask me who my clients are, they're the stores at the mall, right? Yeah. Those people put out two, sometimes three emails a day, every day, 365 days a year. And they have a team of three people, one of which is on the way out the door. Right. And we've had the fourth guy beacon for at least four months. And, you know, like they're always understaffed and too pressed for time, even if they have the staff. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, we added that fourth person that we were supposed to have had. And now we're going to add another campaign every day or five yeah. more a week or whatever. Like, because they think like they have more bandwidth. No, what you achieved was a nine hour a day job as opposed to an 11. 
well, we're supposed to be working eight, right? Like you need, they need to put more people behind it and they need to recognize that it is a, it is a skill. It takes experience, skill, and talent to be good at email. It's not easy. That's not even wading into what people consider the hard or tech stuff, right? We didn't yeah. even mention any deliverability things. That that's a very complicated technical thing. Um, but even just being able to make good email design, that's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Coding a good email is hard. QAing yeah. emails is and really thinking it through is hard. Yeah. Um and all of those things take time. So yeah, that is the biggest thing. Yeah. And that's usually why I'm very successful in those program audits is, is because at the end of them, I will come back with, these are all the short-term recommendations and these are the long-term recommendations. Long-term recommendations are going to need like IT or to buy something or they're not going to happen quick. Short ones are, here's a bunch of things that the team itself could knock out if you gave them time. And usually they come to me and say, do you know how to do these things? Can you come in and manage the team for a couple months to do them? And that's yeah. usually how I get my next project from them. Wow. Because yes, I only recommend things I can actually do. <laughs> because yeah, you're going to look to me and say, well, how do we make that API connection? How do we do the whatever? And I, ne I need to have an answer for you. Yeah. You know, like I need to be able to show you. And that's actually how I usually get in good with the team is I teach them along the way that these things that I've learned that will help you do it faster or up your game or have a meeting where we talk about email between us and share different aspects that you don't realize so that we can get that alignment again, right? Always comes back to the, 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 the time management, the, the time alignment management the team. Yeah. Yeah. And, and budget to buy the tools needed to do the job. Yeah. And, and yeah. honestly, number three is the one you hear about, but that's actually usually a distant third, which okay. really the head count and the Very time. I, I, and I, I, I kind of figured you, know, you got a whole lot more experience in this space than I do, but I kind of figured that that was the linchpin because I, I see the sort of look in the eyes with all the email marketers that I, that I get a chance to speak with. It's like, oh God, I'm tired. <laughs> it's right. Like, uh -oh. Atlas. Um, yeah, and there, and it is, com it's a complicated fragmented. It is not just push a button and hit send to do, no. to do the job. No, and you, you know, you also think about, oh, we could drag and drop it in the editor. That's still not easy. Yeah, it's, it's still, there's a lot that has to be adjusted. No <laughs> editor really makes an email, right? That's right. Like what it makes is a temp, a framework for the marketer to come in. You're still going to have to move this over because the editor shows you one screen and then you send it to that a tool, like an email on Acid or Litmus or any of these rendering tools. And then you're like, oh, oh. Outlook. Oh. Oh, Gmail, Gmail, put the white line in my picture thing again. And I see a lot of criticisms of retail emailers that just make image only emails. They make image only emails because they don't have time to make yeah, a call. To do much, yeah, to do much else. Right. It's not, it's not that they don't realize it or they don't want to do that. Start talking to them and you'll see their lies, their face light up, the eyes sparkle about the ideas that they would love to put into place, many of which would be good. Right. And return, but, return some of those dollars that you talked about. They don't, they don't have the time. Again, they don't have the time to do it or they don't have the permission. No one's willing to take some risks. You know, you got to be able to do that. Well, Luke, we should wrap, but hopefully this last part of the conversation has uh, more than a few companies going, oh man, we need to talk with this guy. We didn't realize we're creating our own problems. Where does someone hunt down Glasner Consult? Well, you can find me at Glasner.com on the web or uh, G L A S N E R, right? Yes, one S G L A S N E R. Um, oh, come on LinkedIn, shoot me a message there, or email me at lglasser at glasser.com. There you go. Terrific. I find Damien on the first three pages. I like it. Thank you. I knew this would be a fun conversation. Yes. Yes. I had a great time. And I My like guest has been email. Luke Glasner. One of the uh, one of the hot guys in the email space. Luke, we're out. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody.